I would suggest like young dance photographers or anyone shooting dance, mm -hmm. study dance photography. Look at it. Go go get the BAM book, the history book of BAM, right? Look at all of the classic dance photography that's in there. Um, yeah. And look at how story was told and, and, and figure out how to tell story. Because the only thing that bad dance photography does, and I know it, this is going to sound awful when it's broadcast, and I'm sorry, everybody, but I'm just being honest. <laughs> bad dance photography hurts dance because mm -hmm. it doesn't engage the audience and it makes the work. Dance photography should make, your goal is to make the work look better than the work is. You are trying oh, wow. to sell in a single image everything that happened in that entire dance, all the strength and the power that that choreography had and those dancers had in a single image. And so your photo has to look better than the dance did. Ooh. And if you're doing photos before a dance ever happens and a choreographer is using it, you, you have to make the dance look better than it does because you're helping sell tickets. Knobbox Dance presents Dance Behind the Screen. Process production and social media. Hey members, welcome to our podcast. We are Knobbox Dance, a social media based company. We strive to say no to the box. We connect interdisciplinary art, technology, and artists to re envision the process of art making and sharing. Hello, it's Marthe, and I'm here with Reina, and we're on a Skype call with Lynn Lane. Lynn Lane is the founder, artistic director, and sound artist of the Transitory Sound and Movement Collective. Lynn has had a long history in the arts and is currently the official photographer for the Houston Grand Opera and the Alley Theater. His work has been shown nationally and internationally in galleries and museums as a photographer, filmmaker, and artist. His history of performance began in the early 90s in the gallery scene and creating many site-specific pieces, which now carry on through the Transitory Sound and Movement Collective. He is represented in New York for his furniture design and has served on the advisory board for the International Contemporary Furniture Fair in New York City. He has curated projects and the anthology film archives in New York City, taught documentary filmmaking in conjunction with the NYC School District, written for International Documentary Magazine, and was represented in the London, New York City for his documentary work. Currently, Lynn's focus is solely on his photography and the development of experiential work with the Transitory Sound and Movement Collective. And without further ado, Lynn, welcome to our podcast. Hey, um, thanks for having me on. Cool. So, Lynn, let's jump right in. Um, can you start us off with how would you briefly describe your career as a photographer? Oh, um, well, in Houston right now where I am, um, I am the photographer for the Houston Grand Opera and the Alley Theater. I primarily shoot in the arts. I shoot dance, theater and opera, all performative based work. I don't shoot any events or weddings or anything like that. So sometimes I do some commercial shoots for publications or a book, but yeah. So yeah, I'm, I'm a photographer in the arts. It's pretty great. Oh, nice to you know that uh, you get to do all those great things. Um, can you tell us a little bit about uh, how would you describe yourself as an artist? Um, I describe myself as an intermedia artist um, because I'm the director of, or the artistic director and founder of the Transitory Sound and Movement Collective. And so I do um, sound and movement based work and intermedia work with that. And photography, I do a lot of personal projects as well as my work based documentary based projects. Prior to that, um, you know, I've design furniture. I had a big furniture design company when I was in New York um, and then made documentary films and represented and was represented in London and New York for my filmmaking. Nice. Lynn, so it's, sorry, go ahead, Martha. Yeah, Lynn, we just feel very privileged to get to speak with you today. It seems as if you've kind of um, had such a wide career in terms of the arts. Um, mm -hmm. And I know we want to unpack that a little bit later on, but I want to begin um, talking more about uh, dance photography specifically. Sure. So. I know from my own experience and too with Reina working with you at Sam Houston State University, Texas Women's University, 
and 254 Dance Fest that you typically are shooting on the fly. You're taking these action shots while the concerts are happening or the dress rehearsals. So I'm curious, is this how you always practice? Um, yeah, a lot of times when I'm shooting, especially dance, I'll come into a dress rehearsal because we typically don't shoot performances, especially the way that I shoot. I run around a lot. Um, <laughs> and so I won't know the piece, but I've been involved in dance for almost my whole life. Um, and so it's something that I enjoy and I enjoy the anticipation of of where the movement's going to happen and trying to capture the story of the piece that I'm shooting. That sounds awesome. So, you know, a lot of times people are doing, they document the performance and I never look at myself right. as documenting the performance. My goal is, is just tell the story of the performance and to help convey what the choreographer is intending for the work um, and to somehow be able to tell that across a single image or a series of images. And I never shoot burst because I think that that's kind of lottery shooting. I shoot mm -hmm. single shots with intention. Um, and I think of photography because my background is painting and drawing. And so I think of photography as painting the way that I shoot it and thinking about light, shadow and movement and how chiaroscuro and, and painting like um, is applied. And I think about that in relationship to photography. I was hoping you could explain a little bit more about the relationship between shooting dance and then relating it to your artistry as a painter. Uh, what, do you, what do you mean by that specifically? I know you mentioned movement and light and shadow, but mm -hmm. could, you, could you, I guess, be a little bit more specific for us? Well, I mean, I've even, when I, I've taught photography, like I taught at the Houston Center for Photography for a few years, and I'm on kind of a hiatus now. Um, and when I teach photography, I teach it from a painting perspective. Mm. That So light and shadow, right? Um, it's like when you think about Caravaggio paintings, right? The, the distinction between light and shadow on a, on a form and how those extreme versions create this dynamic three-dimensionality. And so mm -hmm. I think about that in um, in dance, especially, right? Because we're we're the form is being lit off times from a single vantage point, and so you're getting one side of the body having this beautiful light coming across it, and then the other side of the body drifting off into shadow. So there becomes this delineation in the form between what's lit and what's not. And as that form moves through the space, that changes, right? Because the body's movement changes. And so I started thinking about how does that work? And then, you know, we get into these pyramidal forms, uh, pyramidal forms that the bodies take, especially like in a, you know, like in a, um, a trio, you'll mm -hmm. have different heights and changes within there. And mm -hmm. so you can think back to Caravaggio paintings and like the Ascension of Christ or something and how those forms start kind of elevating through the space and make these triangles. And then you can think about like, you know, these forms occur repeatedly in the arts. And even to when you look at the first B-Boys photo, I mean, not B-Boys, the first Beastie Boys photo that Glenn Friedman <laughs> shot. And it's like in this pyramidal form that looks like this old classic painting and I'm like, well, that's kind of amazing, you know? And so, mm -hmm. so I think, I think about that a lot. And I think when I think about my photography, um, I mean, I've shot a long time, so it's intuitive for me, the settings. Mm -hmm. So I don't really think about that. Like, like I never really think about it, just kind of do it. But I do think about light and shadow and how I see that. Um, and where is the movement? And then when you think about like, you know, the beheading of St. John. I'm just keep making these Caravaggio references. But no, that's anyway. really helpful. That's okay. we can, we'll link those in the show notes so our audience can get an actual visual of what you're talking about. Yeah, so you look at like the beheading of St. John, right? And so so there's this dramatic moment of like, you know, the sword in the hand and the, the um, two people in the window looking down. And there's all these like sub stories that happen. And mm -hmm. I think that happens in dance too, especially in larger ensemble pieces where you have you know, a group of dancers that are in the forefront, which would be the beheading. And then you'll have like the, the chorus dancers that are in the back that aren't having a solo moment at that point, but they're kind of looking at that solo moment. And so if you, if you freeze that and you look at it from a painting standpoint, then you have the, the chorus of characters and then you have the protagonist and the antagonist in the foreground. And so 
You know, it's kind of strange probably to think about it that way, but that is how I think about it. You are listening to Knobox Dance. Lynn, if you could simplify your process of showing up to the concert, right? You're shooting this dance piece. So uh-huh. it starts and then you're done. The piece ends. If uh-huh. you could simplify it into just simple words, um, your process, could you do that for us? <laughs> You just simplified it. I show up and then the piece is over. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I mean like how, how you're thinking about when you're taking these specific shots. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't really think, I'll, I mean, and I'm not trying to oversimplify it, but this is what I do. And I shoot so much mm-hmm. that like I show up and I, and usually I know the choreographers, um, unless it's a choreographer from out of town or if I'm shooting out of town or something. Um, but so I show up. And I'm, I'll ask how many people are in your piece, like, because it's good to know, like, is mm-hmm. this a, a small piece or is it a large ensemble? And then I'll say, you know, tell me, is it bright? And they always say, well, it's, you know, it's kind of bright, but it never is. It's always dark. <laughs> <laughs> it's really dark <laughs> and so, because the human eye perceives light vastly different than a camera does. Right. Mm. And so if a camera is like at 6,400 ISO, then an eyeball is like 200,000 ISO, like in the way that our eyes adjust to multiple, like, because when you're shooting dance at single point, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, Like a single focal point, but your eyes are adjusting constantly to everything. It's like multifocal point. And so, Mm -hmm. so that's always kind of an interesting thing, right? So, so I never, so I'll, I'll talk to them and then I'll see everybody and then they'll say, you ready? And I'll say, yes. And then it's done. And then it's, it's like, you know, it's like watching a movie unfold in front of you that you've never seen before. You have no idea what the story is, but your responsibility is, is to find the story within it and really think about what that choreographer's intent is and make sure that you're telling that story the best that you possibly can. And that's, and so, so my simplified process is I show up, I meet the choreographer we say hello, and then they say, "Are you ready?" And I'm like, "Yes, let's do it." Because usually they're talking to the dancers, right? They're mm-hmm. like making last-minute notes and mm-hmm. then talking. And so usually people aren't talking to me that much because they're very busy, mm. and it's just it's kind of on me to make sure that I make it happen. I look at it as intention, and I yeah, look t- at it as is. How would you like, define in- intention? Right. So like Paulina Oliveras, right? Um, so, so she has this idea of deep listening, right? Mm-hmm. And so you're really not like, I was reading this quote the other day about there's a, a difference between hearing and listening. And so hearing is just your, the way that sounds come into your ears without intention. It's just, we absorb all of the sounds, but listening is having all those sounds come in and being very specific as to what you're paying attention to. And and so that's what I'm doing. I'm listening, but with my eyes and I'm, I'm absorbing all of the visual content that's coming forward and trying to listen with my eyes specifically to moments that are telling the story of the dance. Have you seen a shift in how people are consuming dance with the evolution of social media? Um, yes, I have. I was just actually talking to people about that tonight. Um, and it's something that I talk about a lot. So I think social media, like I have, I have a love hate relationship with social media. Mm -hmm. Um, so social media, I think is really wonderful because it gives us an opportunity to see a lot of things that are out there, but I think it also has a real problem because it, it feeds that instant gratification thing that everyone has. Mm-hmm. Yep. Um, and so I think it hurts the creative process in a lot of ways. Um, prior so? to, well, prior to social media, one of the things that we did as creatives, we had like, especially when I live back in New York, you know, whatever art form one of my friends was doing, we would have these gatherings and people would come together and we would, you know, experience whatever they were sharing with us in the studio Mm-hmm. And give feedback and you had a direct audience that, you know, you, and we do that now, like with the transitory, like in my studio, I'll invite people over for studio shows, like workshopping an idea or something like that, because I think that's a really important process to have mm-hmm. that human interaction and not just, here's a 15 second, you know, clip of me improv or something. And I think that's great. That's good for self gratification, but I don't think it helps you deep delve deeper into the development of your own work. 
And I think that social media. Why do you think that is? I think, I think, I think because the instant gratification, you're, you get that feedback and sometimes it helps form the development of your work because you're Mm -hmm. like, Oh my gosh, I got a thousand likes. People really love what I'm doing. And then suddenly you start going down a path that maybe you didn't explore deep enough on a, on a private level. Mm -hmm. And I think that private development is really important. Also, I think that a problem, like if you look, we never share videos of our development of the work. And I'm really, Mm -hmm. I'm really, I'm really strong headed about that. Because one of the things that's exciting to me about dance is going to a show and not knowing the work and having it unfold before me. Whereas like the surprise uh, moment, it's just that it's beautiful when dance does that. And If people share so much of their rehearsal process, I kind of know the work before I ever see it. Mm, And then you lose that. Yeah, I see the work and I say, oh, yeah, I remember that. I remember that Instagram video of that part of the rehearsal process. Mm -hmm. And I think if that's, you know, and I'm not being critical of people's process and people's Mm -hmm. way of expanding their audience. I think it's great how whatever people want to do. But for me, I'm older school. and, And I think that that private studio development where you're really digging deep into the work and being really critical of the work and then bringing people in and saying, Hey, this is what we're working on. Give me some, give me some real feedback. Give me some honest feedback as opposed to the thumbs up that you get on social media. Right. Yeah. And I think that has a lot of value. I was recently speaking with Jill Homan Randall, who lives in the Bay area and some idea came up about perhaps social media and dance is going to eventually take on its own form, similar to dance film or video dance, because it seems as if there's kind of a, everybody's using social media in such a different way for dance. Mm-hmm. A lot of it is for a promotion, but there are the people that are using it to actually create the work. So sure. it's interesting that, that you bring up that point about needing time for the self before sharing it with others. Don't forget to say no to the box. So, Lynn, you you've been speaking about um, your collaborative your collaboration, excuse me, with Jennifer Mavis, and I'm hoping you can share us a little bit more about what that process looks like and working together. Yes. Oh, great. Okay, so one of the things that's really great about Jennifer is she and I we've had this kind of long cr- collaboration going now from that first show we did about her grandmother to where we are now as a collective. And the collective has changed a lot. You know, Jennifer brings this amazing experience to the table, having lived in New York and she danced with Battle Works, which is Robert Battle's company and Robert Battle's the artistic director of Alvin Ailey. And, you know, she's she's danced all over the world with Take mm-hmm. and, and, you know, worked Dark Circles and um, Bruce Wood. And so it's just... She brings so many different um, levels of experience from dance and different dance forms to the creative process that when we get together, it truly is this dialogue that we start having. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I'll come up with this idea conceptually, okay, this piece is going to exist within this space. And then we just start bouncing ideas back and forth. And we say, okay, now that we're in this period of, you know, the discussion and we've kind of worked in the studio a little bit on sound, a little bit on movement. Mm-hmm. Then I start thinking, okay, what other textures of sound? We're going to bring in a violin. We're going to bring in percussion. We're going to bring in, you know, bassoon. And then, okay, dancers now, how many should this piece be? So like abstraction in the key of yellow, the last piece that we just did at the Contemporary Art Museum here, you know, we had five dancers and the, in- the inspiration for that piece was we went all the way back to, 90s grunge because you know the <laughs> artist Cheryl Donegan um, was playing with the idea of the boredoms and and taking um, you know this abstraction male abstract painting and then reclaiming it because abstractions is t- primarily male dominated and so mm-hmm. she was subverting the ideas of male um, painters and abstraction we said okay well then what we're going to do is we're going to take these ideas of different choreographers like Cunningham and Paul Taylor and you know these really powerful male choreographers mm-hmm. and now so that the, all the dancers were female right and then and then looking back at this kind of male dominated grunge music right and the power behind that and so Cheryl was working with the Boredoms, which is another, you know, band from that period and it's done a lot of stuff. And, and so I was looking at the Melvins and Nirvana and, and that, which is, you know, in that mm-hmm. same language. And so 
I brought in, like I played guitar, really heavy, super crunchy, grungy guitar. And I brought in a friend of mine, Spike the Percussionist. And that's literally his name. His first name is Spike. His last name is the Percussionist. And <laughs> Spike, Spike is an that's amazing great. percussionist. And he just brought that driving percussion. And then we had violin and, you know, we were bringing in, uh, <clears throat> William came in on a stand up double bass. And so, the, and, and William um, Von Reichbauer, who's married to Heather Von Reichbauer, who's a choreographer in Houston. Um, and so that whole thing came together. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and then Jennifer, I showed her, you know, and she knew also the videos from Nirvana of, of the cheerleaders smells like teen spirit. And so we kind of <laughs> looked at that a little bit and like brought it all together. And so anyway, so when we work together, you know, it is that kind of magical moment of like the language that we have and just and just bringing it together in a piece, you know, and, and it's 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 just awesome. You are listening to Knobox Dance. What are like three tips you could share with our audience for taking dance pictures and or making dance videos for social media? Um, you know, it's kind of like so dance photos, if you're taking dance photos, do it with intent, tell a story. Um, make sure that if you're shooting promotional stuff, make sure your work really does tell the story about what the audience is going to see and make it engaging. I think, I think that's the big thing is just shoot with intent and make and shoot engaging photography. Um, how would you define engaging photography? When I walk away from it, I remember it. Mm. And I see, you know, the digital age, everyone's a photographer now. Um, right. And there's nothing worse to me in the world than bad dance photography. Mm-hmm. And there's a lot of bad dance photography. And I don't Could mean to sound like Could you tell us what it looks like so that it's way awful. our audience can learn? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it's awful. <laughs> but it's what's awful about it? Everything. Uh, like, <laughs> are, you, are you talking more about like... I mean, it's, it's form, it's moment of telling the story, it's technical, it's, it's, it's all of that. It's the technical aspects. It's, Mm -hmm. it's the, um, it's, did it really tell a story? It's looking at the moment of the dance. Is it even in focus? Um, Mm -hmm. is it crooked? You know, (laughs) just a basic thing, like get your Uh photo straight. Um, looking, (laughs) Looking at the light and, and shadow and people not understanding how to deal with light and shadow. Um, I would suggest like young dance photographers or anyone shooting dance, mm-hmm. study dance photography. Look at it. Go go get the BAM book, the history book of BAM, right? Look at all of the classic dance photography that's on there. Um, mm. And look at how story was told and 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 figure out how to tell a story. Because the only thing that bad dance photography does, and I know I, this is going to sound awful when it's broadcast, and I'm sorry, everybody, but I'm just being honest. <laughs> bad dance photography hurts dance because mm-hmm. it doesn't engage the audience and it makes the work. You, dance photography should make, your goal is to make the work look better than the work is. Mm-hmm. You are trying oh, wow. to sell in a single image Everything that happened in that entire dance, all the strength and the power that that choreography had and those dancers had in a single image. And so your photo has to look better than the dance did. And if you're doing photos before a dance ever happens and a choreographer is using it, you you have to make the dance look better than it does because you're helping sell tickets. And you're Mm -hmm. trying to get that audience, that one person who's never seen dance before, look at that photo and say, man, I really want to see this. Because that looks amazing. I've never seen dance before, but this photo makes me want to see dance. Don't forget to say no to the box. Let's get into Transitory Sound and Movement Collective. Can we talk sure. about this a little bit? Um, yeah. So the Transitory Sound and Movement Collective was, you know, I mean, the, the name transitory means temporary. Mm-hmm. And it was a temporary collective. And so my idea was, is that initially... Um, it, initially, it was this bassoonist who's in Chicago now finishing up his um, DMA, Doctor of Music. And so, Ben Royd Award, we came together and um, he saw 
He saw this performance. Okay, rewind a little bit. So, so initially, <laughs> Jennifer Mabus invited me to do this next step piece with her, um, and that was a, it was a series put on by Noble Motion. And so I said, "All right, I'll come in and I'll do a sound. I'll do a live soundscape that's um, improvisational and responsive to the dance." And so we were creating this language. And so, um, and the piece was about her grandmother. Um, who had Alzheimer's. And so I asked her to record her grandmother's voice telling stories. And so then I took the recordings of her grandmother's voice telling stories, and I incorporated that into this piece. Um, and so it became this really challenging and, and, and powerful piece about, you know, the loss of memory um, and mm -hmm. the loss of self. And mm -hmm. so we... So the Museum of Contemporary Craft here in Houston asked, they reached out to Jennifer because they had seen that piece and said, hey, we have this piece about, you know, neurology and we would love for you guys to create something. So we created another piece and, and I took more recordings of her grandmother's voice. And so then that first piece had a bunch of dancers and this piece was just a duet between Jennifer and, and myself. And, um, and so Ben this bassoonist came to the show and he saw it and then we became friends and, and started talking and you can edit a lot of this out. And so Ben and I started talking and he said, Hey, you know, we should do something sometime. I said, yeah, we should do something. So we started, we, we initially did this piece at Alabama song that was just a sound piece with film with a couple of other, there was a flutist, a poet. I did all this electronic percussion stuff. And then Ben was on bassoon and then a friend of mine, a filmmaker in New York, made this film, and so we did that. And then I, and then I said, no, you know, that's it. It needs the movement component. And so then, I was sitting down at a coffee shop and a friend, or this place, Double Trouble. It's a coffee shop and bar, but I don't drink. I was having coffee, and so <laughs> I was talking to another friend of mine, a sound artist, and he said, you know, you've got to have a name. And I said, I don't want to have a name. I said, you got to have a name. You can't have a name. Not have a name. And I said, well, it's all temporary. So I said, all right, it's the Transitory Sound and Movement Collective because it's a temporary collective. And, and it's just, I'm the <laughs> main person, but everyone else is going to temporarily come into the collective <laughs> for whatever the piece is and then go away, possibly, or stay on if they want to stay on. And so then it kind of, I was working with, my goal was to work with different dancers and choreographers and explore what that would be like. And we got this um, small residency um, thing at this place called the rec room, which is this amazing, it's an amazing place in Houston that does theater and music. And it's a small space. It seats like 80 people. And we, we went a little beyond that. And so I did. So then I started doing this residency there and we did a show every month for 13 months in that space. But then we were doing shows outside of it also. And so it was really quick turnaround. I was working with choreographers and dancers out of Dallas, out of Austin, Houston, and just putting stuff together and explore and create. And it was really like workshopping ideas and mm -hmm. just having this dialogue between different creatives. And, and so the way that I look at it is that the transitory is um, we invite, we're inviting you into a conversation that we're having in front of an audience. You're invited to witness our conversation and that conversation changes and responds you know, depending on where we are at that moment. And we may have had the conversation a few times in the studio, but that conversation has a certain, initially it didn't have much structure at all. It truly was improvisational. And then it started building and now there's more choreography within it. And there's more, not a, not a score in the sense of a music score, um, but there's ideas. And sometimes the ideas are written. Sometimes they're mm -hmm. drawn. Um, mm -hmm. And so we have like a core structure to the conversation, but then we enter into the space with the audience and the conversation changes. It's like if the three of us are sitting down, we're having a conversation about dance, but you might have a different feeling. Like we may have this conversation today and tomorrow we could say, let's get together and talk about dance, but you might not be in a good mood tomorrow and you might have a real different feeling about dance, but it's still a conversation about dance, but you're bringing mm -hmm. a different component to it tomorrow. And mm -hmm. so then we have to respond to that different component. Right. Um, and so that's something. And then there's the multimedia components. Also the film things that happen that 
you know, we've done things with, you know, different software that, so then the, the film responds to us also to the sounds or the, or the visual imagery response to the sound. So then that becomes, um, impro- you know, not improvisational, but responsive. Mm-hmm. So there's like a real interplay that yeah. that's going on. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I know for me, I but just now, appreciate you. He- oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, but now, um, but now where it's changed and evolved is Jennifer is the main, she is the choreographer that I work with and she and I work collaboratively on the choreography and she also comes in to the sound and gives feedback on that. And now I blur the lines a lot more and I've have the, the dancers also incorporating some sound components too. Um, Ooh, and yeah. things. And so now we blur lines a lot more like, is it sound? You know, I don't view us as a dance company. I don't view us as a, as a, as a, as a sound ensemble. I view us as like an experiential um, sculpture. Mm. And so we're a sound and movement sculpture that lives in front of the audience. That sounds mm. awesome. That's um, so interesting to hear how you describe it and to, to actually hear you share your story of how this all kind of came about. And it seems like it's really focused on this idea of conversation. Mm -hmm. Um, which leads me to my next question having to do with social media again, to tie that in because, Mm -hmm. you know, social media at its core is really about conversating with multiple people, um, in one space in the digital space. So Mm -hmm. I'm curious, what's, what's the role for social media with transitory sound and movement collective? Is it solely for marketing purposes? I know we spoke earlier about how um, you feel very strongly about not sharing videos um, mm. of the work in progress. But, in progress. Yeah, but I guess what does the conversation look like between the collective and social media? Yeah, that, that's and that's, that's a question that I'm like constantly reevaluating. Um, mm-hmm. And I think it's going to change. Um, like right now, social media is a way to obviously share your message about who you are as a company collective, what you do, mm-hmm. and to expand that conversation. Like we're talking with, you know, musicians and choreographers around the world now. And like, you know, we write each other and talk to each other. And it's really wonderful. And and some of the people that I'm huge fans of, we have these dialogues and, and like, you know, it would be wonderful at some point, like, I love what's happening in Berlin. I think what's happening in Berlin is brilliant. And that's Mm -hmm. our goal is, is like, you know, to get back because Jennifer and I both came from New York to get back to New York in the year and, you know, in a year or so and and do a show there. We're already in conversations with people about getting back there and doing something. And then, and then, you know, the long-term goal is to take it. I want to do a show in Berlin because I think what's happening in Berlin is brilliant. I think what's happening in Tokyo is brilliant. Um, And so, that's kind of opening the, the more of a, I think social media opens a global dialogue with people that explore similar spaces to mm-hmm. us and to mm-hmm. just keep that dialogue going. And, and, you know, that's social media for me, a lot of ways is opening a broader dialogue. Um, but it's going to change, you know, social media will become, um, you know, it's also documentation, right? The website, right. Now I've built a site and, and it has the history of all of our shows. And I updated and put, so to, like today, I put shows from our last show. It's Contemporary Art Museum here. And mm-hmm. I put our photos up from the Asia Society from the show we did last month. And, mm-hmm. and so it's, you know, it's like, hey, this is what we do. We want to wrap up with our flash board, where we ask all of our guests to answer four questions in a flash. Are you ready? Okay. Sure. Dun, dun, dun. Okay. <laughs> if you had to recommend a resource to our audience, what would it be? Recommend. Uh, start over because I didn't hear what you said. Um, if you had to recommend a resource or a resource to our audience, what would it be? Well, now I would recommend you because this has been really great and learning more about what Novox does. I think it's a, I think it's a great resource. Thank you. So I would recommend you. <laughs> <laughs> if you had to recommend another resource, <laughs> what, what what would it be? Well, for dancers in Houston, I would say Dance Source Houston. And in Dallas, you have an organization similar. And I would think that, I would say that each city of a major, each major city has their own dance resource. And I would mm-hmm. say go to that resource and be a part of it. Lynn, what was the first dance you saw? Oh my God, the first dance I saw? 
Well, I don't even know. <laughs> so I, yeah, it was I was a little kid watching dance on Miller Outdoor Theater. I mean, I saw, I, I, I mean, I definitely saw Houston Ballet and stuff as a kid. But then I saw a lot of like musicals, like Oklahoma and all of that that was oh, happening yeah. in the city. You know, I mean, I was a little kid, and then and then, yeah, I don't know. I just I saw so much dance on that hill at Miller Outdoor Theater. The, the first step I saw was probably the very first step I saw was musicals. That was the first thing. I saw. That's I had fantastic. That Do you think social media has a positive influence on the dance world? Yes or no? I think it has a mixed. I think it. I think it's a mixed bag. I think it has a positive influence, and I also think it's not. Mm. And finally, what is your favorite social media platform? Oh, probably Instagram. Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> I love Instagram. I just want to say for, from all of us at Nobox, we're so privileged to speak with you. And we just want to say thank you for sharing all these wonderful tips and stories with our audience. But before you go, could you please share with our listeners your social media handles, your website? Basically, how can they all stay connected with you? Okay, so um, I have a few. So on Facebook, obviously, it's just... Um, Facebook.com backslash Lynn Lane. But then there's also our Transitory Sound and Movement Collective page on there. And you can just search Transitory Sound and Movement Collective. I promise we're the only one that will pop up. <laughs> and then um, our website for the collective is tsmcollective.com. And then my face, my Instagram is Lynn Lane Photography. And the Transitory Instagram is I have to look. It's it's transitory underscore sound underscore and underscore movement, but you can probably just type in transitory sound and movement collective in Instagram search and we will pop up on there also. Great. And we will link all those for everyone as well on the show. Yeah, that would be awesome because it's a lot to remember. Our name is painfully long, <laughs> but <laughs> it is what it is. But it's a cl us. clever name. Yeah, TSMC, you can call us that. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, thank you again, Lynn. Those of you who are listening, you can check out the show notes on our website, noboxdance.com, and click on the show notes tab for a full recap and links of everything that Lynn shared with us today. And we just want to say thank you again, Lynn. This has been a wonderful conversation. Yeah, thank yep. you, Lynn. And thank you both. It's been really great. And yeah. congrats on all you're doing. And thank you for bringing all of this to the dance community. We need more information out there and, and resources. Thanks for taking your time to tune into Dance Behind the Screen, a bi-monthly interview series where we go behind the screen to question process, product, and social media. Be sure to follow us on social media at KNOW Box Dance. See you next time and don't forget to say no to the box.